thank you all. Um, we are, um, I want to give you all a gold star for showing up at 6 o'clock, which is not our normal time, um, and on debate night. Um, so thank you so much for being here. It's really my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program on the Electoral College, which is part of our Civil Discourse series. I'd like to start by extending a special thank you to our presenting sponsor for this series, the Meadows Foundation. We are so grateful for the foundation support in making the Civil Discourse Series possible. I'd like to also thank our community partners for tonight's program, Bishop Arts Theater, Dallas After School, Equality Texas, Green Hill School, League of Women Voters of Dallas, Remembering Black Dallas, and Southwest Jewish Congress. We are grateful to our partners um, for such wonderful, to, we are grateful to be partnering with such wonderful local organizations. And last but not least, I always like to thank our board members, um, our volunteers, and our members who are here tonight. We couldn't do this work without your support, and so I am always grateful when you show up for us. If you are not a member or a volunteer and would like to get engaged with the museum, please go to our website and check out the opportunities. We'd love to get you engaged. The goal of our Civil Discourse series is to present multiple sides of a thought-provoking topic through respectful discussion. I think we can all agree that that has gotten harder um, over the last several years, so we need this. We see our role in the community, not only as an educator, but as a convener, serving as a place where we can gather to learn from one another. Tonight, we will discuss the Electoral College. At the end of the panel, as usual, we will have time for a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, please use the note cards that you should have received as you were coming in, and our volunteers will come around and collect those. We'll do our best to answer as many as possible. If you are joining us via Zoom, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type and submit your question. And if we weren't able to get your question answered, we hope you'll visit with our panelists after the program. Please note, this program runs a little longer than normal, but we promise to wrap up by 7.30 so you can hopefully scoot home in time for the debate. Um, and now I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones and electronic devices so that we may listen to our panelists without dis um, distraction. And I would also like to ask the audience to please refrain from clapping or, or even booing, which we've um, heard at a couple of our, um, we get heated, but that is not the sentiment that we are hoping um, to convey tonight. We're hoping to listen with open ears, hearts, and minds. So let's be respectful of all of our speakers and um, in the theme of tonight's civil discourse. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, Lauren Jacobson. Lauren, it's so great to have you back. She's been a panelist and has been a moderator several times for the museum. Lauren's an associate professor of law at the University of North Texas at Dallas College of Law, where she teaches courses in healthcare law, constitutional law, and civil rights law, among others. Her scholarly writing has focused on the First Amendment's commercial speech protections, reproductive rights, and the non-delegation doctrine. I will now turn it over to Lauren to introduce this evening's panelists. Thanks, Thank Lauren. you so much, Mary Pat. I am very excited to be here. I'm very excited to introduce this unbelievable panel we have tonight to uh, talk to us about the Electoral College. Um, so immediately uh, to my left is Wilfred Codrington. He is the Walter Florsheimer Professor of Constitutional Law at Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, where he co-directs the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy. Professor Codrington's research, teaching, and advocacy focus on voting, elections, and the law of democracy, constitutional law, including constitutional theory and reform, and civil rights and the role of race in the law. Professor Codrington is the co-author of The People's Constitution, 200 Years, 27 Amendments, and the Promise of a More Perfect Union. Um, to Professor Codrington's left is Michael Morley. He is a professor at Florida State University where he researches election emergencies, the constitutional right to vote, and the Electoral Count Act. 
Professor Morley is a member of the Florida Advisory Committee for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Before joining FSU Law, Professor Morley was a Clemenko Fellow and lecturer on law at the Harvard uh, Law School, and he also served as Special Assistant to the General Counsel of the Army at the Pentagon. Professor Morley holds a JD from Yale Law School. Um, and then last but definitely not least, uh, we have uh, Jesse Wegman, who writes about law and politics as a member of the New York Times editorial board. He is the author of Let the People Pick the President, the case for abolishing the Electoral College. He is currently writing a biography of, of American founder James Wilson, the most influential drafter of the Constitution and strongest advocate of a popularly elected president. Let's get started. Um, all right, so we're going to start um, with Jesse. Can you provide us some background on the Electoral College? How does it work generally? Who are the electors? How are they selected? And what's their job? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, we're, we're <laughs> howdy. Uh, I, um, so I, I want to apologize in advance for uh, repeating things that uh, people here may already know. I, I will just say that it, I was quite struck in the process of working on my book uh, several years ago how many Americans don't understand how we elect the president, uh, either in broad strokes or in the specifics. Um, I didn't understand a lot of it before the year 2000 uh, when we had our first uh, uh, you know, electoral college uh, and popular vote split in, the, in more than a century. And of course, I think much of the country got newly engaged with the topic in 2016 when it happened again. Um, so bear with me, I'll be, I'll be pretty brief. Um, but as elect electoral college nerds like us like to say, the electoral college is a process, not a place. Um, the, the, the name is, uh, notwithstanding the name, it was, it was not a name that, that the American founders came up with. Uh, it developed over the, the um, uh, ensuing century. Uh, and it, what it describes is the means by which we choose the leader of the country, um, the head of the executive branch of the federal government. Uh, and the way that it works is, uh, and this is through a combination of constitutional provisions and federal law, um, we have the electors themselves, who are human beings. Uh, there are 538 of them. And uh, the Constitution gives each state a set number of electors. That number is equal to the state's representation in Congress. So that means its number of representatives in the House plus its two senators. So in Texas, I think you have 38. Uh, representatives, is that right? Uh, and then you have your two senators, so you get 40 electors. Add it all up, put in three for Washington, D.C., thanks to the 23rd. Yeah, thank you, Wilfred. <laughs> Save me on that. Uh, and uh, uh, amendment, and you have 538 electors. And uh, what, the, what the electors do is you, you actually are not voting for president. Um, you might be surprised to know that the Constitution actually provides you no right to vote for president, uh, but you are voting for electors, specifically a slate of electors in your state, the state where you vote, and this, the candidate who gets the most votes in that state, it doesn't need to be a majority in any state, it can be a plurality, uh, wins in, in all but two states, wins all of that state's electors. So in Texas, uh, if you are voting for uh, Kamala Harris, you will be voting for the 40 Democratic electors who have been chosen. And if you are voting for Donald Trump, you're choosing the 40 Republican electors. Uh, all of these people have already been chosen. They were chosen several months ago. Uh, and they tend to be party actors, people who are interested in politics, people who have committed to support their party's candidate. Um, they are not, as the, we'll get into, as the founders imagined, they are not um, necessarily deeply educated, uh, politically savvy people. They tend to be um, activists, uh, partisans. Um, there's other less polite names for them. Um, but they're good people. They're, they're, they're our friends and neighbors. Um, you may know an elector. Um, it's, it can often just be kind of 
dumb luck how, who ends up becoming an elector. They know somebody who knows somebody um, in, the, in, the, in the county government. Uh, and there you go. And so what happens is on election day and, and in the weeks leading up to election day with early voting, everybody casts their ballots. And under federal law, the elector slate of each state is actually chosen on election day. Determining what that choice is can happen that night if it's very clear, if there's an obvious winner, or it can take days or even weeks as we've seen happen frequently in recent years um, as counts are done, recounts, lawsuits, audits, all of this. Um, and when we get from November, that, that period goes for about five weeks. We get into the middle of December, and in the middle of December, I think this year it's December 17th, uh, the electors meet at, the at their state capitol um, in, in all 50 states. Uh, where do they meet in DC? Do, you, do either of you know? Oh, no? at City Hall. At, or, ci at City Hall? Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, and they cast their ballots. They, they cast a vote for the, the president and for the vice president separately. That's an important uh, detail we'll get to later, um, uh, thanks to the 12th Amendment. And then they, uh, they sign six copies of, of their votes, and they, send, and they go to all different places. They go to the National Archives. They go to the Congress. They go to their, their state uh, uh, leaders. And then over the coming few weeks, um, those, uh, sorry, just let me add one little detail, which is that the election uh, gets certified. The election results in the state get certified by the top election official in the state, although I think the, under the new Electoral Count Act, it's the governor uh, in all cases. Is that, is that correct? Uh, you're, you don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, th it is a uh, the top election official in every state certifies the results. So that's it. They say we accept this as our final result. This person won the election in our state. They got the most votes. They get the electors. A few days later, the electors cast their you know cast their ballots. They send those ballots to Washington, and then on January sixth, the uh, new Congress opens the ballots, counts them reads them out, reads out the results, and you have, presto, a president. Um, and that's all what's, I, I gave you most of what's written into the Constitution and into federal law. Everything else about the Electoral College, the process, happens at the state level. It happens in 51 different jurisdictions, and the decisions about how those electors are selected and who selects them, how, sorry, who chooses the electors and how the electors are awarded, those are decisions that are left to the states. And that how, that last, that last detail, how they're awarded, is I think gonna be the topic of a lot of tonight's discussion. Because as I said, almost all states give all of their electors, the winner take all, they use the winner take all rule, which is all of their electors go to the winner of the statewide vote, no matter how close the margin, no matter if it's a plurality of votes or a majority. Um, Texas is included among that. Nebraska and Maine do something a little different where they give their two of their electors, the ones representing their senators, to the statewide winner, like every other state, but then they take the rest of their electors and, and, and hand them out by congressional district. So Nebraska has three, Maine has two, and those get awarded by congressional district, which allows for those two splits, those two states to split their votes, which they've done several times each in the last two decades. Uh, Nebraska did it, I think, twice, and Maine has done it twice. Um, and there's a very good chance that will happen in both states again this year. So all of that we can come back to, but I do think that the who chooses the electors uh, is an important question, which we don't ask anymore because we assume that it's us, popular votes, right? In each state, we all cast ballots. Actually, the state could decide it's not us, it could be the, the, the state legislators themselves who do it without any reference to the voters' interests. Um, but everyone has done it for the last 150 years or so. And then the how, the allocation, whether by winner take all, congressional district, or some other method, these are the questions that I think engender the most debate and the most conflict when we're talking about what the Electoral College does to American politics and to our life, uh, our civic life in general. Great, okay, thank you. So we will get to the winner take all uh, question in a second. Before that, uh, I want to talk about, I guess, what called unfaithful electors. So I'm I'm curious about what happens when an individual elect when individual electors vote contrary to their state's chosen winning candidate. So 
I think this has happened 157 times in US history. Um, Wilfred, can you tell us why electors might do that? And are there any penalties for sure. their actions? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you. Jesse, thank you for your comprehensive uh, explanation. I should tell you why this is uh, such a confusing process. I don't know if presto was a great word at the end of it to show <laughs> what happens. It seems to be a little bit more contested than ironic. that some days. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so um, the way that it works in terms of, uh, I'll call them electoral defections, right? So um, generally, as Jesse said, we have it such that slates of electors are chosen based on the popular vote, more or less, of the state, right? So the Democrats would choose their slate of electors if they win, and Republicans would choose theirs if they win, and so will other parties that qualify for the ballot. Um, and so in a number of these states, there's a law that says that you are pledging to vote for whoever um, you are committed to vote for. So if Democrats are chosen, the Democratic slate are chosen. They have to choose the Democratic candidate, vice versa for Republicans. That doesn't always happen. Now, I, w I want to say, so uh, <clears throat> Lauren has just raised 157 times that this has not happened. Uh, that's a small amount of times. Uh, relatively, that's less than 1% of all electors having voted through history. So it's not a lot, but it happens, and sometimes it can be um, a little bit controversial, certainly controversial, sometimes consequential, I guess, depending on how we think about that word. Um, and so maybe just by giving two examples of the way that it happens. So the, generally, people are voting for who they're committed to vote for. Um, there are two big ways that they don't, and then there's some other ones. So the, the, the one instance in which they don't that has just happened is death, right? So you can have a candidate die after the popular vote has taken place, so the elect, election day, at least to that point. Now we do mail-in voting and other things we're counting afterwards. But like after that point, when all the votes are in, but before the electoral uh, votes are counted. And that's happened, um, I think it was 1872 with Horace Greeley. He ran as a Democratic nominee against uh, Grant, who was a Republican nominee. Now, Grant won overwhelmingly, so it ended up not mattering as much, but he died, and all his electors just voted. They cast their votes for other Democrats who had sort of nominally been running or weren't running, but that's who they cast them for, right? So they were able to take, I guess, that situation and, and spread their votes out. So that can happen if you have that. The other situation where it's happened, this one's kind of less reported. Uh, I, I believe it was about 35 years earlier. So this was in 1836. And Martin Van Buren was the presidential nominee. And his vice presidential nominee was Richard Mentor. He was um, from Kentucky. Um, and basically what happened there is Martin Van Buren won the Electoral College. Um, his vice presidential nominee did not. Uh, instead, what happened was you got Virginia, the whole slate of electors from Virginia, deciding they were going to defect and vote for somebody else. N nobody to put somebody over the top, but enough to throw the electoral college and the electoral count to the House of Representatives and what we call a contingent election, right? So if nobody gets the majority of electoral votes, then you send it to the House of Representatives for the presidential decision, and they vote by states. Um, and you send the vice presidential uh, decision to the Senate, and they vote by individual senators. Which, you know, um, it's, it's functionally the same thing, given that you know, the Senate, everybody gets two, two states. But you do have splits. Um, what happened with Mentor was, Mentor was a man who was in a relationship with an enslaved woman, Julia Chin. And the Virginians did not like this. And so they decided, despite their pledges to vote for him, that they would cast them for somebody else. And that threw the election for the vice presidency to the Senate. Now, ultimately, I, I think of that as consequential, given what is happening, what's driving it, and the effect, right, um, that we actually don't have this sort of front end process working out as we thought it should, given the circumstances. Ultimately, the Senate did choose Richard Mentor, so they had the power to do so, and they chose him, and you know, that all happened. We had President Van Buren and Vice President, um, Vice President Mentor. I will tell you, excuse me, um, I will tell you that, you know, after this all happened, it, it wasn't for naught. So the next election, we end up getting, you know, two slaveholders holding the presidency and the vice presidency. Um, two people, including a vice president who, you know, had 
it's been a vice president, been president, this is uh, Tyler, and then also went on to preside over the Virginia Secession Convention and got elected to the Confederate House of Representatives, right? And so this is like what was going on in terms of the history after this happens. That's, so that's a little bit detached from where we went um, about the defections, but I just want to tell you that like history is a sequence of events, and one of those sort of, um, one of the things that kind of made that sequence of events happen as it did was this defection in large uh, numbers of electors against Richard Mentor. Um, and then again, the most recent one where we saw the uh, attempts to defect was uh, in the 2016 election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And so this one, you'll remember that Hillary Clinton won by about two million more votes in the popular vote. Donald Trump had prevailed in the electoral college. And so, it was a harebrained scheme that some electors thought that they would cast their votes for somebody else. I think the most popular one was Colin Powell at the time. And what they wanted to do was throw the election to the House of Representatives. So neither Hillary or Donald would win and it would be somebody else. Or that at least that would be an opportunity that would allow the House of Representatives to sort of undermine what the uh, Electoral College and the popular vote had actually done. And so, that is kind of how it happens. Whether it can happen, that's a more recent question. Uh, the Supreme Court decided in this case called Chiafalo versus Washington. This kind of came in the last election, uh, dealing with the Hillary slash Donald Trump sort of electoral defector situation. Um, and the Supreme Court basically said, look, we're gonna look at the history of the Constitution. I have a different view of how this all uh, should have worked out, I guess. But they, I, I, I think, I'd like to think of it as like a chaos election, irrespective of how the arguments could have gone on either side, whether electors should be able to defend Effect, the Supreme Court saw it as uh, important, I think, in an election where we were voting during a pandemic, in an election where we had somebody who had lost the Electoral College previously uh, competing for the, for the uh, House. The Supreme Court said basically states have full authority to um, penalize, fine, remove electors who don't follow through with these pledges if they have them in place. Thank you. Um, all right, fascinating. I, I also think like the view of history, I think we always think we are in a particularly turbulent time. Um, and looking back, we can see <laughs> history might not repeat, but it echoes itself, right? Um, so thank you for that. Um, all right, so let's go to the winner take all issue. So uh, as Jesse told us, 48 out of 50 states use the winner take all method um, in which the presidential candidate who wins the majority of a state's popular vote receives all the state's electoral or votes. What? Or plurality. Or plurality, sorry, majority or plurality. Um, and as Jesse said, we have two states that don't adhere to the approach, Nebraska and Maine. Um, who used the congressional district method instead. Of course, we saw last week there were efforts to change Nebraska law that were that did not go anywhere. Um, all right, so Michael, uh, can you tell us, can you share with us why Nebraska and Maine differ in their approach um, and whether you think there are advantages or disadvantages to splitting electoral votes? Sure. So in, in both states, both states uh, decided to depart from a winner-take-all method to adopt this congressional uh, district method within the past within the past few decades, right? This, it isn't like this is just an antiquated system that they've just stuck with for historical reasons, but it really was a matter that in both states, there was a particular geographic area within the state. Within Nebraska, it was Omaha, the Omaha area. Within, within Maine, it was the more rural area of uh, Congressional District 2. That didn't really reflect the politics of the rest of the state, and so the decision was made, given this disparity between one particular geographic region within each state and the rest of the state, rather than effectively silencing them, which is the effect of a winner-take-all system, that unless you, unless you do have the, the plurality, your candidate receives no electoral votes, the decision was made to allocate electoral votes on a district-by-district -district basis. When states consider the possibility of doing this, one of the main drawbacks 
is that it results in your, some of your electoral votes in effect nullifying or canceling out other electoral votes that you have, right? So if you're, if you're a state that has 10 electoral votes, for example, on a winner-take-all system, whichever ca presidential candidate is preferred by a plurality of your voters is going to get all 10 of those electoral votes. Whereas if you allocate your votes on a district-by-district -district basis, it might wind up uh, uh, in a situation where the statewide plurality candidate with, prevails in only seven congressional districts, the other candidate prevails in three districts, and so rather than providing 10 votes to the candidates supported by the most voters within your jurisdiction, you're actually providing only a net of four electoral votes because the additional three votes for the majority candidate are effectively nullified, effectively canceled out by the three uh, votes that go to the that go to the candidate that would, that would have lost the statewide election. So when legislatures step back and think about whether or not to adopt this system, I think that that's one of the main, and it, it, it's, it's really more of a pragmatic argument that they're reducing their state's influence in the electoral college, they're, in, they're reducing their state's influence over the outcome of a presidential election by allowing some of their votes to cancel out other votes, you know, California, for example, California would not be the Democratic powerhouse that it is if even a dozen of its elect electoral votes or more, you know, were going to the Republican candidate, thereby effectively canceling out another dozen uh, California votes, leading to only you know, a net 30 votes for the for the Democratic candidate. Can I could I add something to that? I I, I want to just um, I thought that was a great explanation uh, from Michael, but I I, I also want to add an element which I think is these countervailing forces and the pressures on states for how to, uh, you know, how to act with their electors. Um, I think the, in, in Maine and Nebraska's case, Maine did it in 1972. They switched to winner take all, I'm sorry, to the congressional district method and uh, Nebraska did it in 1992. And in both cases, they were very explicit. The lawmakers were very explicit that they were doing it because they were sick of being ignored uh, by the national parties. The Republicans and Democrats didn't care about either state because both states were reliably red or blue. And that is the reality for virtually all states in the country. This is why the winner, this winner-take-all rule that has come up now several times is the, really the crux of the matter, is that when a state is reliably in one camp or the other, which means we know what the outcome in that state is going to be, Texas is one of those states right now, the major, the, the national parties don't pay it any attention. They don't visit it. They don't pay. They don't spend ad dollars there. They don't send their surrogates there. It is essentially those states get ignored, and the and the swing states, the states where the, the election is extremely close, they get all the attention. So this year, it's somewhere we, depending on your count between five and seven states that are getting all of that attention. So in Nebraska, in my book, I quote a Nebraska lawmaker who who said. Uh, in 19, you know, when they made the switch, he said, you know, we didn't get either of the presidential candidates, we didn't get either of the vice presidential candidates, we didn't even get a presidential candidate's wife, we got the vice presidential candidate's wife. <laughs> and they were just sick of it, they didn't want to be ignored, they, now, so, you know, on the one hand, there is this other countervailing pressure, which is, as Michael was saying, when he, the dominant party in a state can choose winner take all and deliver all of their electors to their preferred candidates. So it, your example of California is a good one, right? Democrats control California. They have the most electoral votes of all. I think it's now 50, 52, 53, something like that. And all of those go to, go to the Democrat, you know? And there's millions of Republicans in, in California. Those are, they're completely ignored. All the millions of Democrats right here in Texas, ignored. So. There are, there, are, there are these two different pressures going on. Uh, w one is one of them to deliver a big bucket of electors to your, to your preferred candidate, but the other one to get the attention from the national parties that you know, a lot of these states thrive on. So I think you know, at least in the Maine and Nebraska cases, it really was openly uh, an example of we want to be players again. We want to we get attention paid to us, and they do, right? O we're all now talking about Omaha. <laughs> like, when was the last time people and, talked and about Omaha, Omaha? might deliver the winning and, vote, and, and, right? and because of the quirks of this year's, the, the demographics of the country and the, and the politics of the country and where the, the polling suggests right now that, you know, uh, Kamala Harris is leading in states that could give her 269 electors. You need 270 to win the White House. If she got that one Omaha elector, 
uh, which she's, you know, she currently has roughly, I think, a 10-point polling lead. To, so the odds are fairly good she'd get it. That would push her into the White House. So Omaha could decide this whole election. <laughs> that's, that's the system we live under. Uh, and, uh, no offense to Omaha. <laughs> uh, can I jump in, I guess, to yeah. just point out two things to, uh, just since I like history, clearly you're getting a sense of that. Um, first is a little bit about the recent history. So, Lauren, just for people who've sort of not been following, what was going on last week was, and, and the weeks leading up to this, was a decision whether Nebraska was going to go back to the winner-take-all, right? And this was clearly a partisan political move because uh, people want to do exactly what Jesse was describing, deliver the whole state, in this case, for the Republicans. And so there was this debate, and there was also a part of this debate was whether Maine would do the same thing, right? And so what we got was kind of this almost game of chicken that fizzled out in the end. But Nebraska was basically saying, we may do this. And Maine was saying, well, if you do this, we're going to do the same thing on our end, and just so we cancel it out. Um, we got to a point where Maine was in this close, like this window where it couldn't change its laws because it, it needs to take a certain amount of time to take effect, and so that was before the uh, that we were leading into that period. So they couldn't do it anymore, and so now the threat was whether Nebraska could do it, it would do it. It all fizzled based largely on one state senator. They're a unicameral legislator, so they call themselves senators. Um, but uh, it was all based on one person, not mention, not just like one state or district, one person, to decide um, potentially what's going on. And the second part is just this whole idea of delivering your whole state. I just want to sort of bring you back. The, where this really started taking effect, and again, in Jesse's comprehensive discussion of how this works, was, um, you know, the legislator can do whatever they want, right? And so they decide the winner take all, they decide all. They can decide you know, to award in a limbo contest. Nobody's ever done that so far. Hopefully they will not do it so far. Um, but they have that sort of authority. Virginia was persuaded by Thomas Jefferson in 1800 to change to the winner take all. And this is because, you know, there was a diff there were electors who didn't vote for him in the previous election from Virginia. And so once they did that, the impulse is for other states to follow that because then you start getting more clout as a full state, as Jesse was describing, as opposed to separating your votes and sort of, um, sort of nullifying them, as Michael was describing. Um, so I want to go back to what Jesse was talking about with the winner-take-all method, right, which turns states like Texas uh, into spectator states that really have no no clout. Um, what you know, states where one party dominates, right? Um, since candidates know that the outcomes uh, in those states are essentially decided, um, and so candidates have very little incentive to campaign um, in places like like Texas, um, or respond to the needs of voters in those spectator states. Um, and instead, the candidates spend most of their time focusing on the swing states, you know, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, Arizona, um, where we have a more even party split among the voters. So uh, Jesse, I'll ask you first, but I'd love for all of you um, to answer this question. Um, so do you think that this dilution of voter clout in most states is problematic, number one? And then number two, are there other concerns that arise when the election may turn on just a few states and just a few voters. And I think you wrote about this actually last week. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I think the reason we're all here and the reason that people want to talk about the Electoral College is this, right? Which is that um, we, have this, we have these rules on the state level that essentially, and I'll describe, I, you, you might say it's tendentious, but <laughs> they are, I think they erase tens of millions of Americans' voices before the, the technical vote for president happens, which is in the Electoral College. Um, and that can lead, on a national level, to the candidate who wins fewer votes among the entire country becoming president. That's happened twice in the last 20 years. It happens, it's happened five times. Uh, in American history. It nearly happened in 2020. It very, very easily could happen this year. And I think that, to me, is the fundamental dysfunction and I would say democratic insult, small d, democratic insult of the college because the presidency is unique. The president is the only figure, the only official in the country, elected official, whose job it is to represent all Americans equally regardless of where they live. We have governors, we have senators, we have 
Congress members, we have state legislators, we have mayors, we have dog catchers. Every position in this country is, is, relates in some way to a state, except the president and the vice president. And so, as I see it, and as I argue in the book, and this is not a new argument, obviously, uh, that person should be elected the way all, everybody else is elected, which is by uh, the person who gets the most votes. And I think when you use this winner-take-all method at the state level, you get these distortions that have two, two negative impacts. One is the big one that I just said, which is the loser wins, right? That kind of just offends our basic sense of majority rule, which is how the country runs in virtually every other way. And then also, regardless of whether or not the loser wins, we have this distortion of uh, attention, this focus, this focus on arbitrary states that we call swing states um, to the exclusion of the rest of the country. You know, more than 100 million Americans, I think even more than, uh, no, no, uh, well over 100 million Americans live in states that uh, are not swing states. Those states have, there's nothing special about those states. There's nothing wrong with them, but there's nothing special about them. They just happen to have an almost exactly evenly divided electorate. And because of the winner take all rule, a few votes shifting to the left or to the right makes all the difference. We watched this play out in real time in 2020 when Donald Trump picked up the phone and called Brad Raffensperger the Secretary of State of Georgia and said, find me 11,780 votes, right? I mean, I, I mean, it sounds like a mobster, but like what he was doing was actually, t like from an electoral, <laughs> an electoral strategy standpoint, totally sensible, which is he knew that if he won one more popular vote in Georgia uh, than Joe Biden, out of what, five, five, six million votes cast, he would get all of Georgia's 16 electors. And that's a huge swing. That's a 32-vote swing you know, if he took it instead of Joe Biden. Uh, so that kind of focus on those states, the Georgias and the Arizonas and the Wisconsins and the Pennsylvanias, is, I think, quite detrimental to the functioning of a representative democracy that is led by a person who is supposed to care about everybody equally and is supposed to be concerned about the interests that everybody has, not just the people in a few states. Tonight, as... as um, um, as Mary Pat said, uh, there's going to be a debate. And if you go and listen to that debate, I almost guarantee you you're going to hear the word fracking. Mm -hmm. um, why are you going to hear the word fracking? Because fracking is the big industry in western Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is probably the, the tipping point state in this election. And so both parties are very understandably going for the votes of western Pennsylvania. That's not to say that fracking shouldn't matter or that the voters of Western Pennsylvania shouldn't matter, but they shouldn't matter to the exclusion of everybody else. So that to me is really the fundamental flaw with both the winner take all rule and the uh, effects that it has on the vote as a whole. Did that, did that address your question? Yes. Okay. Anyone else wanna? I'll add, I mean, here? Jesse just was talking about distortions. I'll, I'll give two more other distortions that kind of occur. One is um, a distortion in mandate. Right, so the electoral college, because we kind of shrink it down to these 538 people, it's nowhere sort of representative. It doesn't get to like to be close to proportionate to how people actually vote. And so usually, what we'll see is some like big number for one person, much smaller number for another person, when in fact the vote was actually closer, or vice versa. You can have the electoral college seem like it was very close or not so close when the actual popular vote was the opposite, right? And so it seems like the person winning the president has a bigger mandate or a smaller mandate depending on how the votes just all shake out. That's all random. A lot of this is all random. Like, what becomes a swing state is all random. This changes over time with population and demographics and things like that. So that's one aspect. The other aspect about distortion is just actual policy distortion, right? So one thing you do see is that leading up to these elections, you get incumbents actually making policy that benefits the swing states and to the disadvantage of others. And so you'll see things like environmental sort of um, exemptions from regulations in Florida. Jesse mentioned fracking, right? You'll see things related to certain aspects that a state 
that just happens to be a swing state or a battleground state or a purple state or whatever we want to call them, they start getting policy attention in ways that are not as notable and noticeable by Americans, but that also happens. We skew policy to sort of boost electoral um, engagement and hopefully, um, you know, from the candidate's end, um, helping to their reelection. So I, <clears throat> those are all good points, and those are all among the, some of the most powerful critiques of both the Electoral College as well as the winner-take-all system. One defense of the winner-take-all system is that it somewhat serves to offset some of the anti-democratic aspects of the Electoral College, right? So you'll often hear, for example, it's unfair that Wyoming's presidential electors are picked by only about 250,000 registered voters in Wyoming, whereas California's electors are picked by 20 million, uh, by 20 million registered voters or more. And so therefore, the argument is each voter in Wyoming's vote counts for many times that of an of an average voter in California's. When, because states allocate, because both of those states, like almost every other state in the country, allocates their electors on a winner-take-all basis, the impact of each Californian voter's vote is actually many times more than Wyoming because, yes, there's only a quarter of a million voters in Wyoming, but they're only voting for three presidential electors. In California, yes, there are 20 million registered voters in California, but they're voting for 50, 52, 53, 54 presidential electors, right? Close to 18 times the number of presidential electors that Wyoming has. So when you look at the system as a whole, when you take into account not just different differences in the number of registered voters within each state, but the offsetting differences in the number of presidential electors that each state is, that each state is uh, awarded under the Constitution. Overall, while it is not perfect equality among voters across all states, it is, it is far, far more limited and far less stark than just looking at population differences or, or registered voter number differences between states. And if you look to the marginal political power of a voter in California, California under the current system compared to what their political power, their ability to influence the ultimate outcome of the election would be under a national popular vote system where they would be one out of 140 million votes nationwide. Again, the marginal increase in political power doesn't even register till you're six or seven point places out past the decimal point. So the winner-take-all system, while you, you could look at it in isolation, is subject to, some, to, to many of the critiques that we're talking about here. I think it helps to offset some of the concerns that are, that are often raised about the Electoral College. The, one of the other aspects that, that, that we haven't discussed is right, the Constitution as a compact among the people as well as the states, right? So part of the traditional justification for the Electoral College is that it's a way of measuring the popular will, of allowing the people to speak, but through the states. And so it reaffirms the political importance of the states. It allows the states to maintain their existence as important counterbalances, as important offsets to the power of the federal government in general, the power of the presidency in particular. And so it begins to undermine, it begins to chisel away the constitutional structure of states, their ability to play that role, if the popular will isn't channeled on a state-by-state -state basis so that the pres presidential candidates do have to take the interests of particular states into account as well as the interests of particular people into account. But in, in, in looking at the in looking at the 2020 election, I have often raised that as one of the unintended benefits of the Electoral College. The fact that you can have a continent-wide election, an election with na nationally over 140 million voters, rather than having to conduct that as a single nationwide election, we're able to firewall it off into 51 separate elections, right? One election in every state, plus the District of Columbia. And so when Donald Trump is looking for additional votes, he can only call Georgia. There's only a few places that he was able to call simply because getting more votes in North Dakota, South Dakota, other jurisdictions wouldn't have done anything. In situations where you have a crisis, where you have the, the, the sorts of events that were happening in the 2020 election, where you have a national natural disaster, as we, North Carolina, God forbid, is, is, is in the process of recovering from now. My own state of Florida just got hit by a hurricane, and we have a habit of getting hit by hurricanes right before general elections. 
the, the outcomes of the, the impacts of these crises, the impacts of these irregularities, of these disasters, are cabined to particular jurisdictions. Recounts are limited to particular jurisdictions. Litigation is limited to those jurisdictions. Imagine 2020 Bush v. Gore, Florida, on a national basis with 6,000 counties undergoing that same, that same exact process simultaneously. To me, just from a purely pragmatic point of view, cabining and limiting the scope of those post-election issues and post-election disputes is one of the is one of the biggest advantages of, of the electoral college. To, to be clear, um, without the electoral college, <laughs> sorry, without the electoral college, Florida would have been no problem at all. Because if we recall, Florida was lost at last count by 536 votes, and that was out of 500,000 that Gore had won more of. So call Florida all you want. That's not going to change the popular vote. Likewise, Donald Trump can call Georgia all he wants. That wouldn't change the 8 million votes in other places where Joe Biden just defeated him. So, you know, yes, it might cabinet to a certain area, but it also makes it that an easy target for any sorts of electoral machinations. And I think that is the bigger problem here. And with regard to elections, I don't think the choice is one national election versus um, 51 state elections, states are still going to have control over running their elections, right? Nobody, look, if you want to get rid of the Electoral College, it doesn't mean you want to get rid of state-based elections. It just means you don't want these electors in place making or not making a decision that you've decided or in accord with your decision, right? All, you still have the states running their elections. So if Georgia's close, Georgia can run a recount. That has nothing to do with what's going on in California where we know the Republican candidate is gonna get blown out. Fight. Same thing with uh, Texas. Texas will not have a recount because the Democratic candidate is gonna get blown out. It's only these small places. But in these small places, if we can confine our problems to those small places, when we have a larger popular vote, then that's gonna become irrelevant. We won't get to a situation where we're waiting weeks to figure out who's our election as we were in the case of 20, 20, 2000. Desi, I don't know if you wanna weigh in only because, I mean, I think this is something that you, I read your editorial yeah, last week. Uh, yeah, and, no, and you talked about how so, the electoral college and the fact that instead of a difference of four million votes, we might be talking about a difference of 11,000 votes makes the system vulnerable. Well, yeah, yeah, we, it does in the sense that, and, and I think Michael's absolutely right that the, the, the impact of winner take all, especially in larger states, far outweighs that any benefits that you know, the smaller, smaller states get from having a slightly disproportionate number of electors, think, thanks to the Senate. Uh, Senate-based electors, um, we, uh, as he said, often you hear the term, you know, you hear Wyoming and California compared, and that's really not the big problem. The big problem is this winner-take-all rule. Um, but um, yes, uh, last week I, I wrote about how um, sometimes, as Wilfred said, the Electoral College can make it appear that a uh, very close election was a blowout, um, but, but more often lately the reverse has happened, which is that our national elections, if you want to call it a national popular vote, the vote of all the Americans combined has been a margin of 4.6 million on average in this, in this century, so in the last five or six elections. And the Electoral College margin has been under 300,000. And uh, as we remember from the last two elections, 2016 and 2020, it was on the order of a few tens of thousands of votes. Um, and that's where I think I would agree with Wilfred in that I, my concern with this, the, I, you're right that there's cabining going on, but the cabining happens in such a way that when it's combined with a, a winner-take-all rule, those little shifts in a few key places can make all the difference. And I think that creates the vulnerability, right? So the vulnerability is when, say, litigation, for example, over, a, um, over a, 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 some votes or a vote counting method, which happened in 2020, Donald Trump and his allies brought more than 60 cases um, uh, challenging vote, vote results or vote counting methods in states, all swing states, of course, all over the country, um, and he lost them all. But what if, you know, what if one of those had gone the other way, um, perhaps legitimately, you know, it, 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 he just happened to be right and, and that flipped the vote and suddenly, uh, 20 bo votes in Pennsylvania fall into the other category, you know, you could have an entire election reverse on a very, very small 
uh, for a very small reason. I think that the, obviously the, the prime example of that is Florida in 2000, where it was a matter of how votes were counted and who was deciding when that counting was going to continue and when it was going to stop and who was going to do it. Uh, that decided the election for all of us. Uh, as Wilfred said, 500,000 votes separated the candidates uh, nationwide. Uh, 500 votes separated the candidates in Florida. We knew that Al Gore, on election night, 2000, we all knew that Al Gore had won the popular vote in the country. He'd won, he'd, he'd won more votes than, than George W. Bush. And yet, we sat around for 36 days, I think it was, waiting to find out who was going to be the next president. And it turns out, George W. Bush. So that sort of vulnerability, that sort of uncertainty, that sort of destabilization is what I think is, uh, is, a, is a danger for the countries uh, going forward. But 500,000 votes out of more than 100 million votes cast, that's like you're talking about a half a percent difference between the two leading candidates. If those were the vote tallies on a national basis, then the litigation in 2000 and the recounts in 2000 wouldn't have been limited to Florida. If you're talking about a margin of half a million votes out of the entire country, you would have had Bush v. Gore across the entire you, nation. It's possible you would have had more. You're right, you may have had more lawsuits. Let's, but let's, let's dig into that a little bit, that scenario. So on the one hand, we've been watching recounts have happened in states across the country for generations. We have lots of evidence and uh, data on what recounts actually do. Recounts move on average, I think, somewhere between two and 400 votes in an election. Two and 400 votes. So let's do that. Let's do a Bush v. Gore in all 50 states. Let's take the upper end of that. 400 times 50 is what? 20,000? Okay, so 20,000 votes at most changing as a result of all that litigation, or I'm sorry, the, the recounts, state-mandated recounts. I mean, 500,000 is the closest election we've had since John F. Kennedy, and that's not even, 20,000 is, is a fraction of 500,000. So I'm not particularly worried that recounts would, would lead us to that kind of uh, you know, chaos. Also, every state has a, you know, a, 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 its own state legislated recount process that it can undertake. So I don't, Florida was able to do it. I mean, yes, there was some, <laughs> yeah, there, was, there was a lot of uh, chaos there that year. Um, but in, ostensibly, every state has a process for doing this and they can follow it. It's written into state law. It's not to say that everyone's gonna be happy with the outcome, but we have processes for dealing with this and the results of these counts, of these recounts, are minuscule compared to the average margin of victory in a national election. Typically what happens in terms of recounts, just to kind of be clear about it, is states, they all change. They have various numbers or margins of difference when they will uh, prompt an automatic recount. But usually it's around 0.05 or 0.5%, right? Half a percent. I think that's right. So we can go back and look at all the sort of vote tallies in all these other places and look for the places where you were less than 0.5% percent of a difference and like that would tell you what the recount might look like now states can always change what they want to do in light of different and in light of other changes to the electoral college but like as it stands bush v gore wouldn't have been a non-starter and nothing else afterwards would have been non-starters in terms of recounts come because the, the margin nationally was just so large but on, on, on that point, if, we, if the alternative to an electoral college were a national popular vote, then the relevant tallies for determining whether a recount would occur presumably wouldn't be the state-by-state -state tallies. It presumably would be the national tally, right? You, if, if the two presidential candidates on a national level are within you know, 0.5, 0 0.4% of each other, presumably you're not going to have states refusing to do a recount just because you know, in that particular jurisdiction, one candidate happens to be far ahead. I mean, we're hypothesizing about what alternate election laws would look like under a national popular vote system. But the important thing to realize is, right, most of the, cha most of the issue in Bush v. Gore wasn't just about the, the numbers changing because of a recount. It was challenges to the rules governing the recount. It was challenges to the rules governing the counting of votes, governing the acceptance of certain ballots, governing the rejection of other ballots. And that's the sort of litigation where if you're having that in state courts across the country, federal courts across the country, simultaneously 
simultaneously in rushed, harried emergency proceedings, if you are not setting yourself up for chaos, you're certainly, in my view, setting yourself up for a situation where at least half the public is going to reject the outcome no matter what it is, especially if as a result of all of these machinations, something winds up changing in the result. Aren't we seeing that happen now, though? With, yeah, the public with, with is Georgia. I mean, in Georgia, they're literally trying to change the rules for counting now. I mean, weeks before. I mean, early voting has started, and they're trying to change the rules. That's in court this week whether they can do it. But it, I mean, you're right. It's it's happening now in Georgia and not in 48 other states at the moment. But Georgia happens to be an extraordinarily consequential state this year. So in, in some sense, the, the result is the same, which is the election could turn on this sort of uh, uh, litigation slash fights over how we, how we do these counts. All right, so um, we, get, we need to get to questions soon. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask each of you to tell me what you think is the best system for our election process. Should the U.S. abolish the Electoral College in favor of a direct public vote, or should we trust in the system our founders enshrined within our Constitution? What changes, if any, would you support? So I'll ask each of you, we'll just go down this way and tell me, and then uh, we'll get to some questions from the audience. And I, th I think I saw a question in there already. Um, I want to eventually talk about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. But um, Great. So, um, Yes, we should get rid of the Electoral College. If you have not been listening to me, you <laughs> probably know that I want to do that. I've also written on this a lot, so you can find those things as well. I do want to just like tweet the question a little bit. Okay. It's not really the Electoral College that the framers gave us. The Electoral College has been altered on numerous occasions. And so one starts in 1800, 1803, technically after the 1800 election, and you get the 12th Amendment, which changes two things sort of chiefly. One is um, um, the splitting the candidates, right? So now electors vote for the president and the vice president on separate ballots, as opposed to running the risk of what we did early on, of having nemeses on the same sort of running the country together, John Adams and um, Thomas Jefferson, so people who believe two different things. And two, it changed a little bit of the composition of the candidacy for the contingent election. It made it smaller, so you have fewer people that you could choose from if you get to a point where nobody gets the electoral um, majority. But yes, I think we should get rid of the electoral college, and we should go to the same type of election that we use across the country, which is for a popular vote. And, and that, I think, is for many of the reasons you've heard tonight, including the ones that Jesse said. We have one president who's supposed to represent one nation and every individual in this nation. That job, and this is a whole other conversation, but that job has gotten much bigger, much bigger as time has passed with technology, with nuclear capacity, with all the things going on, that is one person, and that person should have the support of the majority. Now, I'll also just mention a couple other reasons why I just think it should get rid of, um, we should get rid of the Electoral College. It has a disproportionate impact on certain peoples, including black people in the South. Um, and that is like wholly tied to the way that it was contrived and designed in the Constitutional Convention and the fact that slaves were brought to the South. So 60% of the country, of the black population, will just not be heard because they are in a place where they are just overwhelmed by Republicans often white voters, right? And so it does these things where it just distorts what we think as an American people and distorts more targeted, in a more targeted way, what certain groups, including historically marginalized and oppressed groups, think about who should be leading our country. And to me, that just smacks of inequality and we should just go to a system that is proven to be equal and fair. Michael. I, I, I support the Electoral College, again, more than anything else, simply because from an election administration perspective, the notion of having to aggregate votes across the entire country, having any crisis that happens anywhere impact that national vote tally, we're 
will lead to disaster at some point. That cabining system, that firewall system, allow limiting the scope of problems of, of a state's election to that particular state, allowing the public to focus on it, allowing the media to focus on it, allowing the courts to focus on it, and not leading to contradictory court rulings in different parts of the country that wind up looking potentially even more partisan, to me that winds up being one of the greatest unanticipated consequences of the Electoral College. Beyond that, I guess I do also buy into the notion of we made the, the, the whole genius of the American government is measuring the popular will in different ways, allowing the measuring uh, allowing the people to express themselves through different mechanisms. And so to the extent we take seriously the notion that states are important, we do need to, to, to preserve the integrity of states to be able to act as a counterbalance against the federal government. And I'll add, we saw this during the during the Donald you know, during Donald Trump's presidency, no one was a bigger fan of the Tenth Amendment than the state of California, right? <laughs> You saw the California Attorney General going to court regularly, right, suing the federal government, trying to enjoin the federal government in order in as 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 a check on on executive overreach, and so preserving a system that was designed in order to allow people's will to be channeled through a federalist lens, I think if we, there, I certainly get the reasons for, for, for wanting to abolish it. I just think over the long term, giving up that structural check will have unintended consequences. Um, the person who gets the most votes should win. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that, I, I don't mean to, I don't no mean coffee. to be simplistic, but I think that's how the majority rule is the way that representative democracies work. If you go back to the founding, you can see all of the top founders said this repeatedly. They said, the essence of Republican government is the will of the majority. Um, I, could, I, I have quotes throughout my book uh, citing them, saying this. They understood it. Uh, James Madison, who had, who had actually flirted with the popular vote idea for presidency at the convention, uh, lived longer than any other framer. He lived 50 years past the convention. And he said at the end of his life, he said, we got some things wrong. And one of them was majority rule is the essence of Republican government. It has to be. And I think that is the lodestar. And I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not here necessarily to, uh, to dictate exactly how we get there, because it's complicated. And we can talk about the popular vote compact. If there's questions about that, we can talk about other constitutional amendments. We can talk about the district system. We can talk about proportional voting. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, nuance and there's a lot of um, logistics here that that are that's hard. And I know that these conversations often break into two parts. One is what's wrong with the current system, and two is how do we fix it. And I know. A lot, enough people feel that something is wrong with the current system that they want to move on to the next question, which is how do we fix it? And the, the hard answer is I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, they've been, there have been more attempts to abolish or amend the Electoral College than any other provision of the Constitution by a long shot. I think we're at over 800 attempts now throughout US history. Um, and we came uh, extraordinarily close in the late 1960s and early 1970s when the House of Representatives actually passed an amendment abolishing the Electoral College in favor of a popular vote. Uh, it looked as though you might have enough states to ratify that, and it was hung up in the Senate on a filibuster by, um, I think, Strom Thurmond, Jim Eastland, and uh, Sam Irvin, uh, all of them uh, Co coincidentally, the descendants of slaveholders. Uh, and uh, interestingly, though, uh, sorry, I'm, to, I'm going on a little tangent here, but interestingly, though, they were, benef they were supported in their efforts to block this popular vote amendment um, by uh, the NAACP and black leaders, uh, political leaders in the North, uh, also um, uh, uh, re uh, ethnic and religious leaders, Jewish and Italian leaders in the North. Why, in states like New York and Illinois, why did that happen? Why were these Southern segregationists making uh, peace with the um, Northern blacks? And the reason is that both of them understood that they had certain advantages from the winner-take-all rule in the Electoral College in the North, um, black and uh, religious and ethnic voters in the in the major cities of the north of the big northern states swung those states. New York was one of the biggest swing states in the country in the middle of the 20th century. And I I'm, I brought my book not only to show it off, but 
because it contains this quote that it remains one of my favorite quotes of all time, and I, and I pull it out whenever people say to me, oh, you're just, an, you're just an angry Democrat or angry liberal who's unhappy with, you know, you have sour grapes. I'm like, no, no. Actually, <laughs> throughout American history, people have been complaining about the winner-take-all rule and people of all political persuasions. So I just want to read you something from one of your uh, fellow Texans. Uh, this comes from... Uh, Ed Gossett, I don't know if any of you remember that name, he was a, a, a member of Congress uh, in 1950, and this was what he said uh, during a hearing on the House floor in 1951. He said, now this, is, this pertains pr exactly to what I was just saying about um, uh, the black voters in the North having an unusual uh, influence in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, please understand, he said, I have no objection to the Negro in Harlem voting, to his vote being counted. But I do resent the fact that both parties will spend a hundred times as much money to get his vote, and that his vote is worth a hundred times as much in the scale of national politics as is the vote of a white man in Texas. I have no objection to a million folks who can't speak English voting or to their votes being counted, but I do resent the fact that because they happen to live in Chicago or Detroit or New York, their vote is worth 100 times as much as mine because I happen to live in Texas. Is it fair? Is it honest? Is it democratic? Is it to the best interest of anyone, in fact, to place such a premium on a few thousand labor votes or Italian votes or Irish votes or Negro votes or Jewish votes or Polish votes or communist votes or big city machine votes simply because they happen to be located in two or three large industrial pivotal states? And I say, Ed, amen. <laughs> so, I Sorry. Um, if you uh, have not yet, if you have a question and you have not yet uh, turned in your card, uh, please raise your question card and staff will come around to pick them up. I already have some uh, questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, so let's talk about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Uh, there's a question about it. Uh, it's been proposed as a remedy to overcome disparities between the popular vote and electoral college. Can you share with us what the compact is? and how it would change our election process if implemented, and would it improve or hinder the electoral process in your opinion, and would it be constitutional? I, go ahead. Okay, so the, the, national, inter, the, uh, the national Interstate uh, Voting Compact seeks to implement a national popular vote within the current constitutional confines of the Electoral College, right? Because obviously it's possible to amend the Constitution to simply abolish the Electoral College, but you'd have to have a supermajority of Congress, you'd have to have three quarters of state legislatures sign on to it, and as a practical matter, that is not gonna happen in the foreseeable future. So the compact, is an interstate agreement that takes effect by its own terms when states that collectively have 270 electoral votes have signed on to it. Right now, states that have, they were, last I checked, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of between 190 to 200 electoral votes have signed on. It's like more, closer to 210 now. Closer to 210, great. So about six, six, 60 plus votes shy. Basically, all of the all of the left-leaning states, where you have a Democratic trifectas, you know, controlling the the legislature and the governor, have have signed on. You would need to have states where at least one chamber of the legislature or the governor is is a Republican sign on in order to hit the 270. But basically, the 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 compact provides that when it takes effect, when enough when enough states have joined. The official uh, certified results of each state across the nation will be tallied together into a national total, and then each member of the compact will appoint its presidential electors based on that national tally of votes. So for example, the, the state of Massachusetts. If the Democratic candidate happens to receive a plurality of votes within the state of Massachusetts, but the Republican candidate happens to win the national popular vote based on these state-by-state -state certified totals, then Massachusetts will ostensibly appoint the slate of Republican presidential electors and cast its, cast its electoral votes for the Republican candidate. The compact has a provision that says states, uh, member states, once it takes effect, cannot back out within six months of a, of a presidential election. Uh, and 
that, that's, that's basically the, the, the summary of it. In terms of constitutional concerns, one objection, and I think this is by far the weakest objection that has been raised, is that as an interstate, it is the type of interstate compact that would require congressional approval in order to take effect. As an originalist matter, that's probably correct, but the way the Supreme Court has interpreted the compacts clause over the, over the years, in fact, it probably doesn't need a congressional, congressional a approval in order to take effect. The other sorts of constitutional objections are the way the Supreme Court has interpreted the right to vote. Is it possible to have the statewide winner of an election nevertheless not take office, in this case, the presidential electors for a particular state who received the, uh, the most votes within the state not take office? There are some arguable tension with, with the Supreme Court's interpretation of the right to vote. There is some potential equal protection concerns that you have states have widely different rules for uh, voter eligibility, how you're able to vote, whether you have, whether you have no excuse absentee voting, that when, you're, when you have state by state elections, each election is conducted separately, those sorts of disparities don't matter precisely because each election is hermetically sealed, each election is separate. When you're effectively taking all votes across the country and throwing them into the same pot and using them collectively to determine election outcomes, there become equal protection concerns, and again, the, these are unsettled, these, rather, these are gray areas, but equal protection concerns under, um, under, of the sort that were raised in Bush v. Gore about voters, about arbitrary and disparate treatment among voters participating in the, in the same election. There's other more technical arguments you can get into, more structural arguments about allowing individual state officials, and there's a question, are electors state officials, are they federal officials, but having a state's presidential electors be based on the outcome of a, of a, of, of, of a national popular tally. But I think the big biggest concern is simply an enforcement mechanism. That at the end of a presidential election, if a Republican candidate does win, is Massachusetts really going to appoint the Republican electors? Is California really going to appoint the Republican electors? If, if a member state tried to pull out, if a member state simply appointed a competing slate of presidential electors, could a court really order the governor of a state to appoint the other electors could certainly a court is not in a position to tell Congress which of a competing uh, slate of electors from a state to accept. So I think part of the problem is on the enforcement end, if, if we absolutely knew for a fact that no state would attempt to defect after they didn't like the results of the national popular vote, that would be one thing. But in the real world, I think we're setting ourselves up for a potential nightmare if we go down that road. Can I offer a, 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 a play on that scenario a little bit? Um, I, get the, I get the concern and I get that people now are, are often in a kind of state-based mindset when it comes to a lot of things about American life where we identify with our state in a lot of ways and for a lot of reasons. I will make a provocative comment here, which is that I don't think I have met anybody ever who cares about the outcome in their own state for the presidential election. Nobody cares how their state voted. They care if their candidate won the election. And that's all that matters. And that's why I think, while you might be right that in a, in a transition period, <laughs> we could see a lot of chaos and confusion over, wait, my state, I thought my state was going for this guy, but now he's going for her. Uh, wait, that's not fair. I think as people transition into thinking as they actually vote, which is for the candidate, not for their state, there will be more acceptance of a national election, an election that happens across the whole country, uh, even if it's counted by the states, even if it's administered by the states, the election is treated as a country election, and the, it is counted that way in the end. It is, it, you do aggregate all the votes, and you see who won. So we have a, a couple of questions about electors. Um, so are electors supposed to be anonymous? No. 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 Okay. Um, Some of them probably wish they were. <laughs> <laughs> and they're kind of anonymous to us, though. Yes. We don't know who they are. I mean, we, we could. Find, you, we can we, do the work. We find out right? when but they... we vote for the presidents. We don't vote for the electors when we go to the ballot in our right. mind, psychically. Right. We're not doing that, even if actually we're voting for these people, we don't know their names. 
And th there's only a handful of states where the electors' names appear right. on the ballots. You you can go on the Secretary of State's website. If you dig if you dig far enough, you'll eventually find the electors for your state. But very few states actually put the electors' names on the ballots. They used to, right? It used to be the standard that you were actually voting for those electors. My book opens with the story of Michael Baca, who was one of those faithless electors in 2016. And he's an Uber driver from Denver who just kind of fell into the job because a friend knew a friend. Who, he was, I think he was a Bernie guy, and then he became a Hillary uh, elector. And w he got roped into this uh, cockamamie uh, <laughs> effort that uh, Wilfred was talking about, where they, they, they called themselves <laughs> Hamilton electors b based on a quote by Alexander Hamilton about the, the importance of electors choosing a, a president of you know, of, of, of true fitness for the office. And they said, Donald Trump is so clearly unfit, we must stop him, let's vote for somebody else. And they, yeah, Colin Powell was one, I think Gary, uh, uh, John Kasich was one, uh, who had been a nominee uh, candidate that year and had dropped out. Um, it was, it, was, it was just a total mess. And Michael Baca was sitting around uh, saying like, nobody should, why is anybody listening to me? I'm not, I'm not qualified to make this decision. So he later just, you know, he wished he had been anonymous. <laughs> I will say that's the, that's the irony at all. Baca doesn't think he's qualified, and yet the way that the Constitution was designed was that we're going to choose these super qualified, very informed, very smart people distributed around the country who can make these decisions that these otherwise dumb Americans <laughs> who don't know how to read or don't have information or only going to vote for their home state person or any number of reasons you want to go against a majority, right? These people were supposed to be the response to that. And now we kind of think about it. We have the internet. We have, we do our research. We, we follow the campaigns. We do all these things. And you have Baca who has, <laughs> you know, in some ways the weight of the country on his shoulder, or at least the way that he's feeling it in a way that does not make any sense. He's actually a lovely guy. So. Okay, but I'm sure he's lovely. <laughs> Baca did not have any weight on his shoulders precisely because Baca was in a state that yes. had elector binding <laughs> and laws. He got kicked out. There was a oh, legal yes. obligation yes. that told Baca exactly how he was supposed to cast That's his vote. That's true. And he deliberately, cho intentionally, and knowingly chose to break that law. That is true. Thereby giving rise to a, to a case that went up to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court ultimately upheld the constitutionality of these laws. And I think one one of the points that we didn't we didn't get to before about elector binding laws, as and if, as an initial matter, about a third of the states in the country don't have binding laws, which means at least as a matter of state law, there is no official restriction on the candidate for whom those electors cast their votes, which I think, especially in light of Bush v. Gore and so, some Supreme Court cases afterwards, raises a question as to whether it would be deemed to violate someone's right to vote for president once it has been granted by the legislature to have a presidential elector cast their ballot either for the losing candidate within that state or for somebody who didn't even run within that state. State. But even for states that have elector binding laws, they enforce them in different ways, right? So in some states, all you get hit with is a fine. So you pay the thousand dollars, but you've still cast your electoral vote. Other states, and if you're going to have an elector binding law, this is the way to do it. Other states, if you cast a faithless vote, if you cast your vote for someone who lost the election in your state, that vote is treated as a nullity. That tr vote is treated as an automatic resignation. You are booted from office, and the governor or the secretary of state, or in some cases, the other electors, appoints a replacement elector, and we keep going through electors until eventually somebody is willing to do their job and follow the law and vote for the candidate that won. And you can be prosecuted. Yes. Uh, Baca faced actually nine years in prison uh, for his decision to not vote for Hillary Clinton. and. Uh, and uh, he, he, they dropped the case eventually, but he could have been prosecuted under that law. Wow. Um, do third party candidates ever affect the electoral college plurality? Yes. How does, it, how, does it, how does that work? Well, the last time it, the last time there was a meaningful impact from a third party candidate was 1968, and that was when George Wallace, the former Alabama governor, and uh, hardcore segregationist uh, decided that uh, he did not like the his old party, the Democrats, had become the party of the civil rights movement, and uh, he thought that the country was going to hell, and he wanted to stop, he wanted to basically blow up the, the election. So that year it was Richard Nixon for the Republicans and Hubert Humphrey for the Democrats, uh, and what um, 
George Wallace did was he, he formed the American Independent Party. That was the third, third party. And he ran on an explicitly segregationist platform with the goal of preventing either of the two major party candidates from winning a majority, thus throwing the election into the House where he could be kingmaker and essentially extract all kinds of concessions from whichever candidate uh, he would give his support and his electors to. He ended up winning five southern states. I think he won 40... 45, 46 electoral votes. Uh, he did not succeed in, in, in uh, preventing a majority. Richard Nixon uh, squeaked out a majority. Um, but he freaked out the country. And it was actually, the, it was the effects of that election that led to the last push to um, pass this amendment that I mentioned earlier, the constitutional amendment to ban to abolish the Electoral College, because people saw that this one guy could essentially throw the entire country into chaos. We almost had this, what's called a contingent election. Contingent election refers to when the election is not decided at that first stage by the electors. It has to get thrown into the House of Representatives, where, as Wilfred said, every state votes, but I'm not sure if he mentioned every state gets one vote. They don't vote by their whole delegation. The delegation gets a single vote, so there are 50 votes that have to happen in Congress. And that means that, in this case, Wyoming and California really do equal each other. That really is the offensive part of the Electoral College. Not that Wyoming has a couple extra electors for its senators, which, as Michael said, doesn't really end up mattering that much. It's that if there were a contingent election, Wyoming's 500,000 voters would have as much power as California's 40 million. And that, that's just kind of the, the, the deepest, the, the sort of most profound offense against majority rule and political equality that I can imagine. And this year, by the way, I think is the, uh, the, the, the greatest chance that we've had that this might happen uh, since 1968. The last time it happened was 200 years ago exactly in 1824. Uh, nobody was happy with the outcome there. And uh, I don't think anybody would be happy if it happened again. John Quincy Adams was happy with the outcome. John Quincy Adams was happy. You're right. You're right. But Andrew Jackson and and uh, an entire movement was uh, were very unhappy. Um. Um, wow, so much can go wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let me go one more question. We have a, a bunch here, but um, I have a question. And I think you've covered it a little already, Wilfred. Uh, but I have a couple of questions uh, about you know, what, what you've already talked about in terms of the way in which the Electoral College was does and was meant to suppress the votes of black folks. Um, so the question here, uh, how, do you, how do historically racist systems play out today in the Electoral College? Yeah, so I, 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 to be clear, um, it didn't suppress the votes of black people initially. Well, that was, there were no votes. There were no black people voting largely because most of them were slaves and so they weren't allowed to vote. Um, and in some places they could actually vote technically, but that was very, very, very rare. Um, so the reason why it sort of plays into the original um, creation of the Electoral College is the three-fifths compromise. So we have two compromises that happen at the Constitutional Convention. One is the Connecticut Compromise. Some people call it the Great Compromise. I'm from Connecticut. It wasn't that great. Um, so we'll call it the Connecticut Compromise. And that basically gave us our bicameral legislator, our House of Representatives, and our Senate. And then there was this other compromise called the three-fifths compromise. Now, this one was odious even more so than the Great Compromise. And this basically said, if you were a state, so when we count up all the people in your state and try to figure out who gets what representation in Congress and because the, uh, the formula builds onto the Electoral College, so the Electoral College formula is grafted on to how we select um, members of the House of Representatives and the Senate in terms of the number, 60% um, of black people would count in that population towards your overall population. And these, like, so there, there's two ways to think about this. One, you can have a system in which 100% of black people count, right? But that would have been grossly unfair because they were all slaves, or most of them were slaves, right? And so now what you're doing is boosting the South for actually, and incentivizing them to expand slavery, right? To holding slavery and expanding it. The more slaves you have, the more votes you get. And this played out early on after the first vote, when, after our first census, when Virginia and Pennsylvania had almost equal numbers of white people, right? 450,000 more or less each. Virginia also had 300,000 slaves. 
And so when you think about who should get what in terms of electoral college, you think that would be about equal, but Virginia got 21 and Pennsylvania got 16, right? And so there was a massive, and there, there were corollaries for this for every southern state on the north into the northern state, because again, the south is where most of the slaves were. So they were all getting boosted for having slaves. Now, that, that changes with the 13th Amendment because that abolishes slavery immediately everywhere. Yet the problem there becomes that 100% issue that I told you about, right? So now black people are 100%. They're still not voting yet. We're still in the 13th Amendment where we're getting rid of slavery, but we don't get to the point where black people are voting. So now the South is going to be like a big powerhouse, right? And so we do some things around the 14th Amendment and try to make sure this doesn't happen. Ultimately, we get the 15th Amendment, say black people can vote. We have this period of Jim Crow where black people are not voting, right? It, all throughout the South. And so, that's, again, one of those 100%, these sort of five-fifths things where black people are counted towards the population of these southern states, yet they're not able to vote. And so white people's votes, segregationists and sort of slavers at these various points are counting for so much more, and they're perpetuating these policies, right? So this continues to go on until we get the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and we get people, black people actually voting in large numbers. And now they can sort of... But, but look, what happens now is we still have a high concentration, this is what I was getting to before, we still have a high concentration of black people in the South. All of my siblings, I'm one of seven, all of them are in the South, right? And you know, we went to the North, but that's because my grandmother, some of them went North, most of them stayed in the South. And because they are in the South, that means where they are over, sort of outnumbered and overwhelmed by people who don't vote like them and vote against their interests as they perceive them, their votes are not gonna count in the presidency. And so basically this idea of wasting votes I, I raise black people in particular because they were front of mind with the Electoral College and our whole system of representation was uh, created, even though they were not there present at present. But it still has that effect in particular to black people because 60% of them still live in the South and these Southern states are not voting the way that they vote. And so their votes basically mean nothing. And, and that to me is very offensive. Um, maybe as offensive as this sort of uh, contingent election, I'm not sure, right? But to me, it's all problematic, right? Because we could get rid of all of this by getting rid of the Electoral College and having your vote and my vote, my vote in New York, your vote in Texas, counting for the same exact thing no matter what, and then determining the popular winner to be the president. Great, well thank you. I wanna thank this unbelievable panel with so much expertise. Thank you so, so much. I also want to thank all of you uh, for coming. We actually have a voter registrar from Dallas County in the lobby. So if you are not yet registered to vote, um, please register to vote in the lobby and vote in the upcoming election, even though your vote may not count. <laughs> thank you. There have are a good other night. races. Vote, please, please. <laughs>